All right. How many of you guys know a know-it-all? How many, how many of you guys know someone who is just like, okay, some thank you for raising your hand. Um, so and you, you just, you know this one person who they just, they know everything. Um, and if you disagree with them, you're wrong. If you disagree with them, you're an idiot. You shouldn't have been born. You should have never existed. You just, you know, how do you guys know that know it all? Now, here's the deal. If, if, if no one popped into your brain immediately, more than likely you're the know-it-all of the group. So, and I see a lot of fingers being pointed around here. So maybe we need to, to dive into that a little bit. But, but you know that, that, that person who's just a know it all you know uh, having sons and especially a teenage son um, the more and more I hang out with Grant the more I know that I don't know anything uh, but that's just that's just how it goes but uh, I don't know it's a teenage boy thing uh, I don't know but, but I had a boss at, at Penn Station and, and I know I've talked about this guy up here before um, but this guy was a know-it-all uh, and he was he was the uh, when I was coming up I was an assistant manager he was a general manager and I worked for him for about a year and this guy knew everything there was not one topic that he was not an expert of. Uh, there was not one thing that he did not know everything that had ever been written on it. And I would say about 40% of what he knew was just completely wrong. Um, and not even close. So once I figured it out, once I figured out that this guy was, you know, really full of it, uh, I started having fun with it. I started asking, you know, of course we worked long hours, you know, we worked 12 hour days together and I would start just, you know, peppering him with questions of stuff that I knew about, um, hoping that he had no idea. And I would just ask him all these questions and he was, it was almost like he was this teacher, you know, pouring into his disciple, all of this wisdom and literally every single thing that he was saying was just completely wrong. And it was, it was this little game that I played with myself to help the time go by. Uh, there was one time he got into a fight with a customer, with a customer, not an employee, a customer. The customer asked us why our, our pizza sandwich came with provolone cheese. Uh, you know, we had a sandwich with pepperoni and ham and onions and mushrooms and pizza sauce, and, and it had provolone cheese on it, a little bit of Parmesan oregano, uh, which was a, an awesome sandwich. Um, but it didn't have mozzarella cheese on it. It had provolone because that's all we had because we also had a cheese steak. So the customer said, why do you put provolone on it, not mozzarella? Well, I am not lying to you. He stood there for about 10 minutes and argued with this guy that provolone was, in fact, the traditional cheese that you would put on a pizza. And, and, and the mozzarella was only a cheap American substitute uh, for the cheese that actually goes on to um, a, a pizza. He said, if you would go over to Italy right now and you order a pizza, it would have provolone cheese on it. They wouldn't put mozzarella cheese on a pizza in Italy, which is the craziest, just stupidest thing ever that you could possibly uh, imagine. But I mean, this guy, I mean, like I said, he, um, he knew it all. He knew it all, but uh, unfortunately knew very uh, little of it. Uh, but, but this morning we're carrying on and, and in our series um, in the letter of James, where we're looking at James' letter to uh, the followers uh, of, of Christ that he knew. And today we're looking at the topic of wisdom. Uh, we're looking at the topic of, of wisdom that comes from God versus the wisdom uh, that comes from the world. Um, so far, we've covered the first two and a half chapters, um, and, and just like the last few weeks, we need to remember um, the main purpose and the main point of this book, and hopefully by now you guys know what it is, and that is to bring the reader to a fuller maturity in their faith. Uh, you know, hopefully by now we can understand uh, that we are trying to grow closer and closer to God and becoming a more mature uh, follower that as we go through our spiritual walk, we are closer to him and we are growing more and more like Jesus. Uh, the purpose of this letter is to grow up. We must grow up and not be little babies when it comes to our faith. You know, we shouldn't still be, uh, you know, toddling around drinking out of a bottle. I mean, we should be well on our way to being fully grown. Um, now, obviously, you know, the faith journey that we live in, you know, it, it is a journey. If you just came to faith, you know, you're, you're going to be uh, less mature in your, in your spiritual walk. Uh, but as you grow and as we go further, we have to grow and grow and become more and more uh, mature. Um, so James has spent this whole time of talking about maturity and what that looks like in our lives. I mean, it looks like all of these things that James has talked about so far. Um, this, this maturity looks like our actions matching what our faith says. Um, this maturity is our words matching uh, the faith that we have. It's, it's having joy in trials. It's remaining steadfast in this life. It's doing what the Bible says, uh, not only hearing the word, but doing the word. And that's what the spiritual maturity is. So this morning we're going to carry on in that uh, part of maturity by looking at the realm of wisdom. 
Uh, wisdom it is so important. Wisdom was important in the first century, and it's so very important now. Um, and what is as important as wisdom is where we get our wisdom. What is the source of the wisdom that we live our life with? And more importantly uh, than that is, is how we live our lives with the wisdom uh, that we go through. And James covers every bit of it in the text this morning, but, but this isn't the first place where James talks about wisdom. If you remember in the first uh, chapter, one of the first topics that James covers is wisdom. Uh, this is right when he's setting up the letter. Uh, this is in verse five of the first chapter. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. So James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, if anyone lacks the wisdom that they need in this life, just have them ask God and God will give wisdom to them generously. Uh, that word generously that James uses there in the first chapter literally means without stipulation. It literally means with no strings attached. It's not a quid pro quo of God will give you wisdom if you do this, or God will give you wisdom and because you did, you have to do this. No, it says God will give you wisdom generously with no strings attached, with no stipulations at all. Now, now this wisdom uh, that, that James is talking about here, and, and this, the word that's used for wisdom is the same one used throughout the entire New Testament, um, and it's, it's sister word in the, in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. It kind of, it, it means the same thing, but it's this massive, all-encompassing uh, word. You know, uh, if we're going to uh, unpack the topic of wisdom, we need to know exactly uh, what this means. This word wisdom, both in the Old and the New Testament, it is generally uh, most of the time in chapter three, it's paired with the word understanding, wisdom and understanding. It it's having um, not only knowing something, but knowing why and knowing how and have the, having the discernment to use that. Uh, but when we unpack this word wisdom, um, it, it is so broad. Uh, it means to be full of intelligent. It means uh, to be knowledgeable in diverse matters. It, it means the wisdom which belongs to men, specifically very knowledge of, of things that are human and divine. Um, it talks about being acquired, acutest, and experience summed up in all of the Proverbs. Uh, the, the science and learning. Uh, it's about the act of interpreting dreams, uh, giving sage advice, uh, intelligence and vice, and, and discovering the meaning of mysterious numbers or visions, uh, skill in the management of of affairs, uh, uh, devout and proper prudence when dealing with men who are not disciples of Christ, skill and discretion in imparting Christian truth, the knowledge and practice of re re uh, requisites for godly and upright living, the wisdom of God and from God and uh, forming and executing councils and the formations of governments of the world. So what you can see is this word wisdom is not just knowing something. This word wisdom is not just um, you know knowing things where you can go and win a trivia night or it's not just knowing things where you can go and pass a test. I mean, it's literally knowing what to do and how to live your life. You know, it's wisdom in science and learning. It's wisdom in interpreting dreams and visions and giving advice. It's wisdom in the management of affairs. Wisdom in dealing with non-believers and being able to impart the truth of God. This wisdom that's, that's spoken about here in the book of James is talking about living an upright, upright and Christian life and being able to get through this world with that knowledge. It's not wisdom to be a know-it-all. It's not wisdom to be arrogant with. It is knowledge, it is understanding, it's discretion and discernment so that we can get through this life. So James says, if any man lacks that wisdom, wisdom to get through this life, just have him ask God. Now, in the third chapter, um, James is going to expound on this topic of wisdom a little bit. And he, start, and he talks about uh, that this wisdom should come from God and what we should do with this wisdom. Now, remember, James has just come off this topic, um, this great passage of the tongue where uh, he talks about that the words of our mouths should match the faith that we have for God and that how the fig tree cannot bear olives and the grapevine cannot produce figs. And it's right from this that James swings into this topic of wisdom and, and they're perfectly connected. This is what James 3, 13 through 15 says. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, uh, do not boast to be false to the truth. 
This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So James goes straight to the demonic. I mean, right, right, and he goes straight to the demonic state there. James says, who is wise among you? Who has knowledge? Who has understanding? Who has discernment? Who has discretion in this life? Who has wisdom to get through this life and live it the right way? Who is wise among you? And he says, if you are wise, you can see who is wise because they will deal with this wisdom and it is in their hearts and in their lives with meekness. He says, the conduct of your life will show if you have wisdom from God. So here's James connecting these last three or four paragraphs of the text together. He says, he says, who of you has wisdom? Because if you do have wisdom and it's from God, then you will live your life uh, in, in meekness and in humility. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same as of him saying, you know, he who has faith in God will have works that follow that faith. They will have works that prove that faith to be genuine. Uh, he who has faith will then have words that will back that up to show that that faith is genuine. He says, if you are wise and if you have understanding, let it be shown by your conduct. Let it be shown by the way that you live your life. Let it be shown by your, mute, your meekness. Let it be shown by the humility that you show in that wisdom. And then James says, but, but if there is jealousy and there is selfish ambition in your heart, if there is selfishness in this wisdom that you have, then you don't need to be boasting in that wisdom. You don't need to be standing up and speaking out on that wisdom because that wisdom that you are speaking through, if there's jealousy and selfish ambition and envy, uh, then it is nothing but from this earth. It is unspiritual, it is ungodly, and even so much that it is demonic. Man. That's huge right there. We could see from James' writing that there's this, this perfect test to see if the way that we live our life and, and the influences that we have in our hearts that are guiding us in this life are from God or from not. Now, we need to understand one thing before we fully get this, this concept of wisdom. In this culture, in the Jewish culture around the first century, wisdom was everything. Wisdom was everything. You see, you'd have people and they would go to the common areas. They would go to the synagogues. They would go to the temples. We see, um, you know, through the book of Acts, we see uh, uh, Paul going through all these places where these people would gather and speak. Uh, the whole point of it is they would go and people would stand up and they would speak these great, lofty, very wise words and people would come and they would listen. And they, the whole point of it, the whole goal of these people going and speaking and spewing all of this wisdom was so that people would follow them. The people uh, that they, their fame would grow, and that their fortunes would grow, that they would be these great, awesome people. I mean, that was the main thing in the first century. You know, the fame, the fortune would follow these people um, that, that spit out this wisdom. I mean, that's how that culture worked. And, and nowadays, when we stop and we look at the 21st century, we're not that far off. I mean, all you have to do is look at social media and the rise of, of the influencer to know that it's pretty much exactly the same thing. People get on TikTok and Instagram and they make video after video after video, all with the hopes of going viral, all with the hopes that they'll be monetized, all with the hopes that they will gain this following uh, and gain this group and then become, uh, have a fortune from that. It's the same exact thing, just in a different method. But the same thing happens in both the first century when you have these people standing up talking and in the 21st century making videos on TikTok and Instagram, the wisdom that comes through these places so many times is not from God and it's not from above and so many times it's just the opposite of what God would want us to do. So James is telling this group of believers that their wisdom needs to be different, that they need to behave differently with this wisdom that they have. He says you don't need to boast in this wisdom that you have. If your wisdom comes from God, then the conduct, the way that you conduct your life uh, will be so different that you don't need to boast about it. And he says, but if, if your wisdom is filled with selfish ambition, then it is not true wisdom. And the vast majority of wisdom both then and now is not from God. It's not from above, but it's earthly. And James says it's demonic. James says that this wisdom does not come from God. It's unspiritual and it's earthly. I mean, that is huge. 
That is huge because so often what we do as human beings, especially in the 21st century America, we strive and we strive and we chase after wisdom. We chase after, um, you know, knowing as much as we can. We chase after filling ourselves with the things of this world. Yeah, we may not call it wisdom, you know, but when we chase after the things of, of entertainment and music and we fill our hearts with that, then that starts to guide us and that starts um, to develop the way that we live our lives. And it shouldn't be that way. James says this, these things that are driving you should be from God. They shouldn't be earthly. So it's very crucial that where we get our wisdom from. It's very crucial on how we live our lives with this wisdom. James gives us the perfect uh, formula to figure it out. Look at the very next verse. There's one verse. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. James is talking about wisdom here. He says, wherever there's selfish ambition and where there's jealousy, then there will be disorder and vile practices. He says, wherever there's selfish and pride and jealousy, when it comes into the realm of wisdom, there will be disorder. Man, and that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, if I claim to have all of this great wisdom and I have all of the answers to all of the universe age old questions and I teach and I teach and I teach, but everything that I teach is wrong and it's not from God, then it is going to lead to disorder. It will lead to evil. It will lead to division. And if I bring that into the church and, and I come up here and I stand before you as a minister and I have arrogance in my heart and I'm doing everything that I'm doing in order to build my own kingdom, to build my own brand, and the only reason that I would ever want this church to grow is so that people will see me, then we have come into a place where it is ungodly. Mm. There will be disorder. There will be division. That is why selfishness and envy and jealousy always leads to disorder. But what's the alternative? What's the other side of the coin? What does it look like? If that's what earthly wisdom looks like, what does godly wisdom look like? Here's the next couple verses from James. He says, but wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then it is peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, James puts this perfect contrast here, doesn't he? He takes a few verses and he says, look, this is what earthly wisdom will get you. This is what unspiritual, demonic wisdom will get you. It will get you disorder and vile practices, all manners of brokenness, but... But if you have wisdom from above, you're going to have peace and gentleness, open to reason, full of mercy, full of, of good fruits. It's impartial and it's sincere. That is the direct opposite of the world's wisdom. Wisdom that's from God is above. First and foremost, it is pure. It is undefiled. It is pure. It is morally just. It is morally right in all things. God's wisdom is peaceable. It brings peace to people. It does not start rivalries. It does not bring opposition. It does not cause division. It is gentle with other people. It's not harsh. It's not an annoying know-it-all. God's wisdom is open to reason. Uh, it, it's gentle. You know, it's, you know, God's wisdom is not because I said so. God's wisdom is open there. God's wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. Uh, God's wisdom doesn't beat us down with the truth. God's wisdom doesn't cut our legs out from under us with how wrong we've been. And there's mercy, there's good fruits. God's wisdom produces great fruits. If all that is left in the wake of our uh, quote unquote wisdom is disorder and dysfunction, then we are not filled with God's wisdom. But if we're filled with God's wisdom, there will be fruit like caring for others and loving others and serving for others, serving others. And there will be so much kingdom work that comes from that. God's wisdom uh, is for all. Uh, the truth from that wisdom is given freely and openly. There is no favoritism uh, from the wisdom of God. We don't prefer certain people over others when we give wisdom. We don't spare the truth for other people and then bring it down um, on others. It's for all. It's sincere. God's wisdom is not fake. God's wisdom is not a cheap knockoff. God's wisdom does not have to show off or have this pretentious display of, amb of, of the ambitious world. God's wisdom is great. And we have to have it be a part of our lives, a part of every aspect of our lives, because that very last verse 
that James said there shows us this great truth. He says there is a harvest of righteousness sown by those that make peace. He says those that use God's wisdom in their lives to bring peace, they sow a harvest of righteousness. How awesome would it be to sow something that brings a harvest of righteousness? Uh, but the truth of the matter is that when we live our lives within God's wisdom and we take in what God wants for our lives and we live our lives in that way and we let him guide us and direct us, then the righteousness that is sown is scattered to all other people. Those that are around us will benefit from this harvest of righteousness. Man, this wisdom that is, from, that is from above, this God's wisdom, I mean, it's not selfish. It's not envious. It's not jealous. Um, and as a result, it does not cause any division or discord or dissension, especially within the body of Christ. I mean, there is a very clear and distinct difference that James pushes out for us in this realm of wisdom. Of, of how we live our lives, of the influences that we let come into our hearts that, that guide us in our, our lives. And there's a very clear and distinct difference and it is imperative for our lives that we live our lives driven by God's wisdom rather than the wisdom of this world. And let's be honest, there's no greater place that needs God's wisdom uh, than our churches. And you would think, well, you know, of, of course, of course the church, uh, you know, has godly wisdom and, and, and those who, uh, you know, lead churches, you know, live godly wisdom. Uh, but but the, the truth of the matter is many people who lead churches fall into the footballs of trying to go on their own wisdom. It happens all the time that the churches must be, uh, you know, those that lead church must do all that they can to lean on God and his wisdom. You know, those that lead churches, uh, you know, it's, and that's a broad term, and that could be elders, deacons, ministers, that could be Sunday school teachers, worship team uh, members, so many other areas, but we have to rely on God's wisdom. Uh, in his first letter, the apostle Peter uh, was talking to the church leaders and talking about wisdom and talking about leading the flock. This is what he said. He says, so I exhort the, the elders among you. And as a fellow, fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd this flock that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, not, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your church, uh, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, who's Jesus, appears, you will receive this unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So right here, Peter says, shepherd the flock with humility. And those of you that are in the flock, you need to be under uh, those people who are shepherding you. He says, don't be domineering. Don't do it for gain. Don't do it because you have to. Don't do it because you're compelled to do it. He says, don't shepherd for the wrong reason, but instead do it because of love. Now notice Peter is just echoing the same thought that James is giving. He says, don't do it like the world. He says, those that lead in the world, they lead in a way that's domineering or they lead because they have to do it or they lead because they're going to receive something from it. But he says, because you're a leader in the church, you need to do it completely different and you need to lead this way. And Peter ends this thought uh, this way. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time, the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the, the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Man, you know, being in a leadership position in a church is something that is so important. It is such a great responsibility. Church leaders have a great charge. Leaders in this church have a great charge, a great responsibility. Leaders in the other churches in this community have a great charge and a great responsibility. And church leaders across the world have a great responsibility and a great charge. Our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Man, this is 
leaders in the church, it's our responsibility to be humble and to live under the hand of God so that we can lead our flock to be safe from the schemes of the devil. Man, God's wisdom is so important. God's wisdom is so important and it is so crucial that the body of believers constantly be praying for these church leaders, for their church leaders, for the church leaders in the community and around the world so that we can rely on God's wisdom to lead as best we can. But God's wisdom is not just for the church leader. It's very important in the church, but, but God's wisdom and living a life worthy of God is for each and every person. It's not just in the church. It's, it's every single person who calls themselves a Christian, every single person who has come to Christ. And this wisdom of God is available to all, and it should be in each and every one of us. When we go into the office, we should be calling on God to give us wisdom. When we're walking into school, we should be calling on God to give us his wisdom. When we're walking into our homes uh, to, to be with our spouse, to lead our families, we need to be uh, coming into that wisdom and understanding of God. In this life, the discernment and the discretion that God gives us is so important so that we can live a life that sows a harvest of righteousness all around us. But how, I mean, how do we ensure, as, as Christians, how do we ensure that we are seeking the wisdom of God? How do we know that we are chasing after the heart of God and his wisdom? I mean, if you open up the book of Proverbs, it is full of so many great words on wisdom. It's so filled with so many great ways for us to follow after God and chase after his wisdom. Look at Proverbs 11.4. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humble, there's wisdom. This is, we can't come to God's wisdom from a sense of pride, but only through humility. And as soon as there's pride and arrogance in our hearts and in our lives, we know that we have moved away from that godly wisdom. What about Proverbs 10, verse 8? It says, the wise of heart will receive the commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. He says, if we are wise and we are living in the wisdom of God, then we will come to a place where we receive the commandments and the reproof of God. When we come to a place where we are no longer seeking the commandments of God, we're no longer seeking the direction of God, then we have moved away from the wisdom of God. Look at uh, uh, Proverbs 9, 8 through 10. He says, do not reproof a scoffer or he'll hate you. Instead, reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be a still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. He says, don't reproof a scoffer, someone who's coming in and being like, oh, I don't even do you. someone who's proud and arrogant. He says, don't reproof them because that will just cause them to hate you. But if you are living in God's wisdom, then you can come to them and have people correct you. You can receive instruction, and as a result, you become more wise. You become closer to God. And he says, then the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of God is the beginning of insight. One more from the book of Proverbs, from chapter 15. It says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoice in the heart and the good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to the life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. For the fear of the Lord is, and is instruction and wisdom and humility comes before honor. And if we give ear to reproof, we dwell among the wise. If we welcome instruction, we gain intelligence. If we fear the Lord, we are instructed in wisdom and humility comes before honor. Man, there's something that, that we've got to notice from every single one of those passages of Proverbs. Every single one of those talks about humility. Every single one of those uh, is calling us to put our pride and our arrogance aside and come to God in humility saying, God, give us wisdom. But we can't come to God and ask for his wisdom with a know-it-all attitude. We can't come to God and say, God, I need you to fill me with your wisdom, fill me with your knowledge, fill me with your understanding, fill me with your discernment, all at the same time saying, God, I know the right way to do it. I know what's better. Mm. 
We have to come to a place of humility to come and receive the wisdom of God. And man, let's be honest, this topic of wisdom is so important for us to fully grasp and understand right now. Yeah, I mean, it's always been important. There's always been worldly and, and demonic forces that have caused, that have tried to divide the follow of Christ away from God uh, and his wisdom, but it seems so much more important now because it seems like worldly wisdom is winning. What passes for wisdom, what passes for common sense in the world today is so far from godly. And it shapes everything. It shapes everything. It shapes entertainment. It shapes movies. It shapes TV and music. It shapes video games. It, it, it shapes what is accepted in society. It, it shapes what is seen as what is good and what is right and what is bad and what is immoral and what is immoral. This earthly wisdom is all about what's good for you. It is good for you. It's right. Think positively. Work on yourself. Above all, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you feel good. Do whatever brings you success. But so often, that's the opposite of what God calls for us. Yet so often, that is what we chase after over and over and over and over again. We chase after it. And a lot of the times we see this Try to creep into the churches. We see, you know, so much of the world's wisdom coming in to the church where we, we try to do church like the world does the world. It shouldn't be that way. So it's imperative that we, as followers of Christ, live in the wisdom of God. It's imperative that we live in the understanding of God so that we can have the discernment and the discretion to know what is good to know what is right, to know what is pure, to know what is the will of God. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth of the matter. As human beings, we're going to follow wisdom. There are influences on our lives, and we're going to follow uh, what those influences give to us. And we can follow earthly wisdom. We can follow earthly influence. We can follow this broken, sinful nature. I mean, that's what our default is. And we go on and we live our lives opposite of what God wants for us. We go on trying to build up our own lives. We go on trying to build up our own kingdoms. We go on trying to just um, grow our own platform, our own brand, and we knock people out of our way on the way there. Or... We follow the wisdom from above. We follow uh, the influences of, ab of above, the influences of God, where he says, walk in this way. Love others, love me, serve others, uh, and spread the gospel. You see, you have a choice. You have a choice, and it's a choice. It's not you make it one time and it's done. You have a choice that's every single day, every single moment of every single day. Of, are you going to follow the wisdom and the influence of the world, or are you going to follow the wisdom and the influence of God? So look at your life. Look at your life and ask, are you living in the wisdom of God? Are you walking each and every single day in God's wisdom? Are you handling the interactions and the conversations that you have on a daily basis within the wisdom of God? Are you walking in the wisdom of God as you go to work every day? Are you walking in the wisdom of God as you go to school every day? Are you fully relying on the wisdom of God in your marriage, the way that you treat your spouse, the way that you serve your spouse? Are you relying on the wisdom of God as you parent your children, as you help them grow? grow in Christ? Is your life marked with the fruits of God's wisdom? Is the way that you handle this life and its situations marked with uh, gentleness and mercy and peace and sincerity? Or are they marked with selfishness and jealousy? And as a result, are you living in a wake of division and strife? When you look at your life, do you see God's wisdom all over it, or do you see earthly wisdom and earth, earthly influences all over that? If 
you don't see God's wisdom all over your life, we need to ask him for that wisdom. Because remember James' words from the first chapter. He says, if a man lacks wisdom, let him ask God for it because God will give that to him generously without reproach, without any strings attached. We need God's wisdom to get us through this life. We need God's wisdom to guide us through this life. We need the influence from above to live this life in a manner that is worthy of him, that brings glory and honor to him. So ask God for that wisdom. Ask God so for his wisdom to fill you up, for his understanding to just be in your heart, to be in the forefront of your mind, to have his discretion and his, uh, his, his knowledge and his wisdom all over you. And don't just pray that now. Pray that every single morning, every single afternoon, every single evening. May this prayer of asking God for wisdom become the most prayed prayer in your life. And as we close, I want to read uh, from the first chapter of Ephesians where the Apostle Paul is talking to the people in the church. And he's praying wisdom over them. This is what it says. He says, I do not cease uh, to give thanks to you, the thanks for you. Remember you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the workings of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we're so thankful for this uh, wisdom that you give. We're so thankful for this, uh, the fact that you can give us this wisdom to get through this life. Forgive us for the times where we have said, God, we, we can do it on our own. Forgive us for the times where we have said, no, God, I, I've got this. I don't need your help. Forgive us of that. Break us of that. So that every single morning, every single afternoon, every single evening, we say, God, I need you to just pour out your wisdom on me. I need you to pour out your understanding on me. Give me your discretion in this life. God, we pray that we open up our eyes to you. We open up our hearts to you every single day. God, we love you. And we pray that as we live this life, we bring glory and honor to you. We love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come to your house. Let us leave this place with your wisdom. Let us go and bring glory to your name. To the sons we pray, amen.